companies that treat uh, their employees and their partners and their customers with respect are more productive. Welcome to Architecture Corner and episode 20. Today's guests are Grieger Wigstrand and Joachim Lindbom and they will talk about how to improve software productivity. Welcome Grieger and Joachim. Thank you. Thank you Casimir and uh, thanks for having us on the show again. We have been developing software for more than 50 years but the productivity has not seen the same gains as in for example the manufacturing industry. So what can we do about this? I think first you could talk about uh, comparing to manufacturing. Uh, I think it's uh, perhaps unfair. We're talking about a very creative process, w- which is not really something you can put into a square box and uh, look at like you manufacture a car. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't expect us to have that kind of gains uh, over time. But still, of course, that is a lot of things you could do. There, there is a problem with this idea that you can compare easily software development to other industrial processes. Uh, an often cited example uh, is uh, the construction industry. Yep. And uh, construction industry is a kind of a model for where you use a waterfall approach. Well, you know, first you design the house, then you build the house, then you use the house, right? Design, build, mm-hmm. run. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it was like that in the 1950s when almost everything that was built was a greenfield development. But it's not like that today. Today uh, we have more of brownfield development. We have uh, changes inside cities and so on. And it, it is quite different than, uh, you know, when you take down a wall uh, to uh, remodel it or fix it or something, you never know what's inside the wall. So, so actually the comparison is uh, it's not true anymore. No, that's totally right. I mean, and of course, I say in, in the 50s or like, like the, the, the first um, moon mission, I mean, I mean that kind of uh, situation, that's a very clear waterfall. You have a specification, you write the software for, for the rocket and, and, the, and the lander, when it leaves, you can't change anything anymore. So, I mean, that, that's a typical situation where, where the waterfall approach is very, very, very good. Uh, but exactly as you say, I mean, we have today system landscapes and, and systems which are in a situation or in a state where you really don't know what you're approaching. You're trying to change something, but what will happen, you don't know and you can't know it. But, but even in the space industry, the, the, it's a regular practice to upload new software uh, to remote probes. Yeah, these days, absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, that, that's something where you can, uh, today they can do it because of the communication uh, capabilities. They can actually up- upload software uh, and you can, you can uh, utilize that. Uh, so even that kind of uh, industry is changing uh, or has changed a lot. Mm. What, what are the blockers for software development productivity today? I think that it goes back to actually mindset. A lot of uh, things we're seeing today go back to a mindset which actually has its roots and basis in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so we really need to rethink a lot of things. But also looking at the, the legacy situation, which I talked about a lot uh, before in this show, uh, there might be ideas and knowledge and, and the capabilities, but you have a system which is not in a state where you can do what you would like to do. Uh, so that, that's typically one thing. Uh, another thing would be that looking at the uh, different kinds of, of, of tools used today, they are quite oldish, I would say, in many ways. Uh, the, the speed or the pace when you can integrate different kinds of development tools is too slow. Uh, and that would be uh, going into solution space. I think that's a really good way of why you should really start thinking about development platforms where you have everything in place from the beginning. Uh, yes, so uh, we uh, did a project with a client recently where we were able to, in just uh, basically 14 working days, uh, set up a new uh, product for them. Uh, it's, it's, not a huge pro- pr- it's not a huge product, it's a minimum viable product, but it meets the business needs they had. And that was because we used a, a platform that allowed us to build on existing stuff in a fast way. Yeah, I would say that uh, for myself it was an eye opener. Um, when I first, the uh, very first time when I, in, I think about two, 2008 or something, when I approached and used uh, Amazon Web Services and set up a virtual machine, I mean, with absolutely no uh, knowledge beforehand and absolutely nothing set up, within 50 minutes I had a virtual machine running. For me, that was an eye opener. That extreme speed to something which could, could uh, b- 
plus benefit or yeah, value. Yeah, to at talking the same to all the colleagues, they say, oh, but then we need new servers. How long does that take? Three months? Yeah. And uh, no. no, no, it's three seconds. Yeah, exactly. 15 minutes first time when I actually practiced it was much, much faster. And exactly the same thing is happening right now with the, with the development platforms. Okay, so I need a development platform for, for Java. How long time would it take me for, for, for getting that? Well, not three seconds, but we're talking about minutes in reality. Mm. But, but you know the thing uh, about software development productivity? Uh, it's easy to talk about processes, methods and tools. And of course that needs to be in place. Uh, another very important factor is uh, the skill of your developers. You know that uh, the, uh, let's say a typical developer has productivity of one, however that is measured. Then uh, a good developer has a productivity of 10. And a superstar developer can have a productivity of 30. But there are also crap developers who have zero or minus one uh, in productivity. Yeah. So, so the, the, the range of uh, productivity uh, varies a lot. Yeah. And, and the more you impose processes, methods and tools, the more you narrow the range uh, to where you get to the kind of one yeah. uh, normal productivity. So, so you help the, uh, the not so good uh, people to be better, but, but you also prevent the really good people from being good. You bring down, yeah, that's true. So there's a balance between uh, productivity um, for certain people, and like we call it the hero culture, and uh, with um, doing big projects with lots of people where there is a big variety of skills. So, so you really have to think what kind of project is this? Is this a superstar project or a bread and butter project? Yeah, and also not only the product, I think actually in different phases in different areas. I mean, I, I, I could foresee a situation where you have these superstars or the, these explorative hacker kind of, of uh, guys or girls, and they are really, really beneficial. But you should think at which phase in the product, what part of the product, what kind of features, and so on, and what is bread and butter. And I think we really need to th rethink, because we talk a lot about, okay, having a, a w one team and you scale from one team, I'm not really sure that that approach uh, is scalable, actually, because then you c would end up scaling this average um, gray matter and not the superstars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the more developers you have, the more PMT you have, the fewer uh, people reach superstar productivity levels. Mm. Uh, uh, in uh, extreme programming, there is this thing called development spikes, and that is where the superstar developers go ahead and do a, a, a first development mm -hmm. that then can be enhanced and you know after that you can add all the different exceptions and paths and possibilities mm -hmm. but they they do really quickly with high quality the first basic setup that you need yeah and the skeleton you could say in some way uh, with some features put into it yeah so an mm -hmm. another thing that is very important for so we, we i mentioned skill i mentioned process and methods and tools another thing that is very important for productivity is um, culture and relations in in the company and and with suppliers and customer so it seems that people uh, companies that treat uh, their employees and their partners and their customers with respect are more productive and this goes back to this situation that th this is not manufacturing we're talking about. This is not just a square box. This is a creative process with creative people who need to be in the right mindset to be able to w do their work. If you don't treat your people well, they will back off. If they have another option. If they have enough, yeah. And, but often it could be backing off either physically that, that they leave, that, that's one, mm. one thing, but they could back off in productivity. They could the back off in, in their, exactly. They, they just, okay, I'm doing my work eight to five. They tell me what to do, I don't think anymore. And if you get that kind of, of um, response from the employees, you, you're, you have a major problem, of course. What's your recommendation about how to improve it then? I think that one area could be going back to the platforms, that you make sure that you don't start out with, with a blank paper and uh, sort of think about what kind of uh, development tools, what kind of testing tools, what kind of deployment tools and so on would I do use and what, how would I combine those? It takes too long. Use a, use a platform where everything is integrated and working together from the beginning. But also look into the platform. What kind of, of um, prefabricated parts can I use? Don't start with a blank paper for your solution either, but rather start on an 80% level yes, and that's just fill a in. template project because Te most, template, yeah, most yeah. projects are the same. They're, 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 they're basically types of projects like, uh, you know, uh, 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 database with a web front end there's a uh, kind of editor tools there are uh, data flow tools and so on but th there, there are a limited number of 
applications out there. Yeah. And so, I wouldn't be too, too afraid either to look into the open source space. I mean, we are seeing a lot of really good uh, templates, you could call them, uh, in, in the open source space. And, and what it gives you is not only a viable and working product that you can stand for, but actually that you can change, you, you can modify it to your needs, as long as you're obliged to the, the licenses. I, so uh, another thing about open source that makes it interesting to look at is that people are volunteers. And if they don't like how the project is being run, if they don't like uh, how it's being developed, they, they'll drop off. Hmm. So, so the open source projects that keep running uh, with lots of people engaged in them for, uh, for years and years, that really has something to teach all of us on how to, uh, let's call it manage projects, but it's not projects, it's an organic thing growing there. And there is this thing called InnoSource where you try to approach uh, the, the problem with applying uh, open source ways of thinking, organizing and so on, but you apply it within an organization. And there are some, some quite successful ways of doing that. And we've seen a, a few customers re which have been very good at this. And uh, I think it, it, as said, is an organic thing. You need to give, make things rolling and going. You can't just order people to be creative. You can't order people to do these things. You need to get the, the momentum from the organization itself. Some people think that innova innovation, creativity is an inborn talent in, in some people. I think it's an inborn talent in all people. It's just about creating an atmosphere where it can happen. Yeah, you're very right. And, and one problem, of course, is that I mean, sometimes if I look at the demands I get uh, in this situation I work, I need to be creative Tuesday morning between 9 and 10. But sorry, I can't schedule that. It's something that really needs to be in the entire situation. It's, it's about <coughs> what we can learn from open source, right? Yep. And what we can reuse from open source. It's about using platforms uh, that help us. It's about applying processes, methods, and tools in a way that uh, enables and, and not disables uh, productivity and creativity. It is about finding these superstars and, and letting them be superstars. Because, you know, a factor, uh, so you could pay one guy twice the money and get 30 times the output, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a good deal, isn't that, it? That's a good deal. And I think one thing also learning from open source is actually being lazy and being very um, being careful with your time because open source is driven by people doing this by passion and their free time and they don't want to, s to waste time. So looking into tools, look, I mean, the entire DevOps thing coming from automatic deployment and so on comes from open source simply because people didn't want to sit in the middle of the night and manually deploying over and over and over again. So these people invented a way of doing that. And this kind of, of way of looking at time, how would I utilize time best? I think that's also something we should learn from open source. DevOps is a very good example of how to improve productivity because uh, faster feedback gives higher quality. Yeah, really. And also respecting the, and the feedback both from the, from the user perspective but also from the developer's perspective that you as a, as a developer would see how is my work working out? Does it work? Does it actually produce what I want to do? Do I have the right tools? Do I have the right approach? Or could I improve something? So it's not only an end user perspective, it's also the, from an internal perspective, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, that's what, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. uh, quality, and uh, when quality is higher, it's also easier to build. Uh, you, we see these uh, buildings in the third world falling down when people add floors and floors and floors, mm -hmm. because the quality of the first floor wasn't that good, and then you added the second floor, and you added the third floor, and when, when it comes to the seventh floor, whole house falls down and everyone in it dies. Yeah. And, and that's what comes from in uh, lack of quality and, and lack of following up of quality. Mm. Um, in, in the latest uh, um, uh, World Quality Report, uh, we could see what I think is a very good trend, that companies are spending more and more of their IT budget on testing. Mm -hmm. Because having testing, not as an afterthought, but as an integrated part of, of the quality work, in one way, you can see it as, uh, as being about turning requirements into something that works. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the thing that maps between what you need and what you get is testing. Yeah, and pr proving it out. Yeah. And putting that into the process very early. I mean, I've, I've seen it so many times where you can detect uh, errors very early, the fail fast approach. And, and even, I mean, you should have it built in from the beginning, but also actually uh, applying unit testing, early unit testing in existing products can be extremely viable and extremely productive. It's been really nice to hear you talk about how to improve the productivity. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon.